Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, ECG of the week. Uh, we have a pretty interesting case for you today, so let's get right into it by having a look at uh, another look at the clinical vignette from this week's ECG. And let's now uh, go ahead and take a look at the ECG. Now, um, like we've been doing week in, week out, we're going to use the six-step method to uh, interpret this ECG, uh, and then we'll point out some of the interesting findings that we have here. So why don't we go ahead and start with the rate, uh, and we'll probably just use the 300 method here, because uh, that should make it easy enough. Um, if we pick, again, one of these QRS complexes that's really close to the line there, and then count how many big boxes you have one, two, three, and then the other. Um, the next uh, R peak is there, and so our 300 method using that, we take the 300 and divide the number of boxes that we have, and we have a BPM of about 100 beats per minute. And so that will be our rate there. Uh, then we'll have a look at the rhythm, and I'll just keep those two dots on, on those there, and then we'll see if our rhythm is regular by moving these around, uh, around to the subsequent R peaks, and you can see that they're lining up pretty nicely there, so we are dealing with a regular rhythm, which is quite good. Um, next thing we are looking at is our P waves. Now, um, the uh, isoelectric line in this tracing is kind of a little... Um, you know, tricky. It's not as maybe flat or straight as you'd expect, but uh, we can see that this here is our P wave, um, and then you have P waves, uh, and I'm looking at the rhythm strip just because it's very clear here um, at the bottom, and you can see P waves going all across, uh, and then the second thing we look for in the P wave um, s section is to see that these P waves are all followed by QRS complexes, which they are, which is nice. It shows that we have a nice normal electrical conductance going on there. So that all looks very good. Next thing we do is we zone in on our QRS complexes and we kind of see again, are they narrow? Are they wide? Uh, and remember our rule for QRS complex is less than 120 milliseconds, which is less than three small boxes um, so you have a QRS complex here that is uh, just kind of about two-ish, <clears throat> excuse me, small boxes uh, for the QRS complex. Um, and that's less than our three, um, right? So it is less than 120 milliseconds there. Uh, and that is a nice, normal, narrow QRS, which is what we expect to see. Um, next thing we like to look at is our PR interval. Um, uh, and again, we're looking for a range there from the beginning of the P wave uh, to the beginning of the uh, R wave of the QRS, less than five small boxes or less than 120 milliseconds. So let's count our boxes here. One, two, three, four. Uh, Actually, probably five, uh, which is good for us. Less than five, less than or equal to five small boxes on the PR interval. So that's a nice normal PR interval. Uh, and then the last thing that we're looking at is the ST segment. Now, zooming back out and just looking at the ECG as a whole, uh, that gives us all the information with the rhythm strip that I'm using here at the bottom. But you can probably tell that. Uh, if you kind of look more globally, that there's some interesting things going on in this section of the ECG, um, particularly with your QRS complex and with your ST segment. So if we kind of zone in here, looking at predominantly V1 and V2, uh, you're seeing um, something interesting, right? So this is your QRS complex here. So this is your S wave and then your T wave is actually there. And the same thing is happening here where this is the S wave and this is the T wave. Uh, and then you have like this happening kind of consistently in V1 and again in V2. 
Um, and, and it looks like uh, ST elevation, right? Um, this segment, you normally, right, we expect to hit the J point after the S wave, hit the J point, have a nice electric uh, period, and then a nice uh, upstroke on the T wave. But you're seeing this really big ST elevation happening here. And then you have this T wave inversion happening and the same thing is kind of happening in V1 with ST elevation like that and then T wave. So uh, this it mimics the pattern of um, a STEMI. Uh, and it really does look like you have a ST elevation in, in a STEMI. Um, uh, but that's not actually the case, um, funny enough. But you do have, you would just mark that there's ST elevation in V1 and V2 and some T wave inversion. There's also T wave inversion here. Uh, in V3, uh, and that is part of the answer to this week's ECG. So let's have a look at our findings. Uh, we said our rate was about 100 beats per minute, which was great. Uh, regular rhythm, we had our P waves and they were all followed by QRS complexes. We had nice narrow complex uh, QRSs as well, uh, about 100 milliseconds, and then our PRR interval was normal. Uh, e that less than or equal to five small boxes um, with that. And that was about the one in the ECG was about 200 milliseconds, which was uh, pretty good. And then we have this ST elevation that we saw in V1 and V2 uh, particularly, but not globally. So what do we think it is? Is it a STEMI? Uh, looks like it, but it's actually not. Um, we have isolated ST segment elevation just in those two leads. Um, and uh, ST elevation in the STEMI actually looks a little bit differently, but uh, this is actually a case of Brigada syndrome, uh, and we'll get into what that is going forward. So what is Brigada syndrome, and why does it produce this uh, classic ECG finding? So uh, Brigada syndrome is what we would call a channelopathy. So this is a genetic defect in the sodium channels, and if you kind of remember your uh, cardio... Um, physiology, uh, you know, kind of your uh, conductance uh, patterns for uh, normal contraction with your potentials kind of mostly rely on sodium. Uh, and then you also have potassium and calcium in the balance as well that produce your um, uh, your con your contractile forces there. So this is a defect in that sodium channel. There's two uh, well-known causes or two well-known genetic mutations in the uh, SCN5A and SCN10A genes, and they kind of produce this channelopathy that you get. Now, why does it look the way it looks? Why does it kind of have that ST elevation? Why does it have that STEMI issue? Uh, what you'll, or how, why does it mimic uh, STEMI in a way there? Uh, and what you'll find is when there's this... Re um, defect in the sodium channel, you kind of have um, a, a poor sodium inflow currents uh, in, in mostly in your, in your, especially in your right ventricular uh, muscles or, or part of the, your, your heart there. So uh, that is kind of what they think is the cause of the uh, ST elevation uh, just linked to the sodium channels there. You have this uh, current uh, that's called the right ventricular outflow uh, tract transient outflow. It sometimes is um, written out as I, uh, ITO, and you might see that. And that particular uh, outflow current gets disrupted when you have this type of channelopathy. So when you have reduced sodium inflow, this outward current is also... Short, it, this outflow current um, is also reduced, and that shortens the duration of your action potential um, in your, um, particularly in, in your um, ventricular depolarization phase. Uh, so that is a little bit of the background on it, but really the, the linkage between the ST elevation and, and the channelopathy itself and, and the sodium currents is not fully understood um, but um, there are some other things uh, that are prevalent or that are uh, indicative of Brigada syndrome if you're looking at it. And just to note that when you have a diagnosis of Brigada syndrome, you might get this ECG that has that finding of um, ST elevation, particularly in V1, 2, 
and or three. Um, and so you'll see that ST elevation and that little T wave inversion as well. Uh, but it really is cannot be diagnosed alone on the ECG. You need uh, the clinical findings uh, as well from the history. And so one thing to look out for is that it's very prevalent in um, the s uh, populations from Southeast Asia, particularly men. Um, uh, and then it also is associated with uh, family history of sudden cardiac death. Um, and there's a couple of other uh, risk factors to, to keep in mind as well. But those are just some that might, might jump out to you so that you have to know your history. And then when you see this, particularly on your ECG, it might lead you towards Borgata syndrome. But the ECG alone is by no means diagnostic. Um, and then just to remember, like, you'll see it and you'll probably think it's a STEMI, just like we were saying when we looked at the interpretation from this week. But uh, you'll, you'll know from your history whether it is a STEMI or not. Interestingly enough, this is the um, actually the uh, it, it's the cause of the, the most the highest incidence of sudden cardiac death in patients that have structurally normal hearts. Remember, it's a genetic defect in the channel. So heart is structurally normal. You just have this deficient sodium channel. So these people have structurally normal hearts, but they have these kind of odd um, ECG findings and they can uh, progress to sudden cardiac death and be asymptomatic, in fact. So that's kind of uh, what we're dealing with when we talk about knowing your history versus just kind of assuming that the ECG is going to give you um, the, the diagnosis there. Uh, and then just to kind of look more in on the morphology of the QRS complexes in, or the ST segments rather in your Borgata syndrome, there's actually three types that you can have. Um, this type one is the one that we kind of saw there in, in our case this week and you get this uh, large ST segment elevation commonly in V1, 2, and 3. Um, there it is again, and there it is again. You'll notice that as you kind of go down from V1 to V3 that the um, S, the uh, peak of the ST is kind of gradually decreasing, but you'll it is elevated above normal. So that's something to keep in mind. And then you also have this T-wave inversion as well that's going to happen in your uh, type 1. Uh, these, uh, the ST uh, morphology is usually called coved type ST elevation, which is what we saw on this week's ECG. Uh, different, differentiating type 1 from type 2, you still, again, have the same ST elevation, uh, but the morphology is a little different. It's what they call, the what we call saddleback, and that's kind of referring to, like, this shape that you have here, or like this shape that you have here um, for your uh, saddleback ST elevation. Uh, and then type 3, uh, is uh, it can be similar to type 2. It also can sometimes look a lot like type 1 with the cove type uh, ST morphology, but the only difference is that the uh, amount of elevation that you see there is less than in type 1 and type 2. So we're talking about the actual amplitude of the ST um, uh, elevation in, in type 3 that's a little bit reduced, but it still would be considered ST elevation. So those are your three types of Borgata, uh, and I think the, the most common thing, or the most important thing to remember is that type 1 has the uh, coved ST, uh, and uh, remember I said that you couldn't make a diagnosis just from the ECG alone, but uh, this coved ST is pretty um, indicative, or it's pretty classically seen in Borgata syndrome, so they'd say they often call this Borgata sign, uh, and this is one of the one potential diagnostic finding, but it would definitely lead you to think more of Borgata syndrome versus another another pathology. But again, your history your, uh, is going to really tell you and differentiate this from something else. And how do you manage Borgata syndrome? Now, um, we know it's a channelopathy. Uh, it is particularly a uh, uh, defect in that sodium channel. So because the hearts are structurally normal, uh, because there's really only the, the channel, the sodium channel defect, the gold standard is placing a, a implantable cardioverter uh, defibrillator, so an ICD placement. That way, if there's progression to uh, other complications like VT, or if there's, uh, like I said, these people are, are who have Borgata syndrome are at a higher risk of sudden cardiac death, the defibrillator is, or the ICD rather, is, is well able to monitor um, 
monitor the electrical activity and provide a shock if necessary to prevent kind of complications. Uh, you can also use pharmacological management with quinidine, uh, which is a, a known antiarrhythmic. Um, and you can also use um, sodium channel blockers like we're saying here, um, but that's uh, not really, you know, curative. It's a, it's a good management tool, especially if you're working with a type 2 or type 3 uh, type Burgata syndrome and you can uh, change it into a type 1, um, which may help you diagnose the ECG, but of course, again, with some help from your history. Uh, so what are our takeaways? Um, the history is really the key here. You need a thorough history. You need to know all of those potential risk factors that are associated with Borgata syndrome because, again, the um, ECG is not going to tell you alone. So we're, the, these risk factors to keep in mind are uh, a history in the patient of VFib or VT, uh, ventricular tachycardia, um, a family history of studying cardiac death that occurred in the family member before 45 years of age, um, e inducible VT with electrical stimulation, history of syncope, um, all of those things. And then uh, if you get a type 1 subtype of Borgata syndrome, then the coved type uh, ST segment elevation is going to be your Borgata sign. But those all together are going to kind of make your uh, diagnosis more, lean more towards Borgata syndrome. Um, so without the comprehensive, the uh, extensive and thorough history and family history, like you're going to see that ST elevation and you're going to think that this is an MI or a STEMI and, and it really isn't. Uh, but um, the the biggest thing kind of to keep in mind when you're looking or when you, if you ever see this or if you notice this uh, e particular ECG finding and, and notice from the history is that um, the sudden cardiac death is kind of the biggest risk uh, and that can go undetected because again, these patients will have no structural abnormality normalities in the heart, but, and they'll often be asymptomatic, um, and they're at risk, uh, then, but, uh, you'll know, um, that the, or you'll need to take a, a good family history as well to kind of, uh, put that into your diagnostic criteria for determining Burgata syndrome. And that's the case for this week. I hope you enjoyed, uh, keep, uh, it tuned for more ECGs coming to you week, week in, week out. Um, and have a look at some of our other videos on our YouTube page if you need a refresher or if you want to check out some other cool cases.